about last week. It's the, it's the, one, it's the one time that the, the children's church pat answer, the children's Sunday school pat answer actually is 100% accurate. <laughs> Oh, that was always the thing. If, you, if you've ever taught from about the age of three up to about the age of seven in, in Sunday school, and you ever ask a question, who did this? Jesus! That was always the answer. So, <laughs> yep, yep. There we go. So, all right, unless you're asking about, you know, who, who it was that tempted Adam and Eve, then that's totally not the right answer. <laughs> All right, so tonight we are going to continue down this story of the Bible. Um, again, we're going, we're going through a book called Story Through the Bible. And the purpose of this, of this book is to show how Jesus was the thread throughout the entire scripture. Everything in the Old Testament looked forward to Jesus. Everything in the New Testament looked back to Jesus. And in the center of it all was his resurrection and his redemption of all of us. Amen? So, um, tonight we are going to talk in particular about John the Baptist. Okay? So, what do we know about John the Baptist? He was Jesus' cousin. And he was Jesus' announcer. He was, he was the MC to the coming of Christ. <laughs> okay? What else? What else do we know about him? He baptized with water. He baptized Jesus. He was beheaded for what he believed, okay? And, uh, yeah, we don't get into, into that, but yes, he, he was, and the reality was he was close to actually, actually convincing, I believe it was Herod, wasn't it, or Herodias? Herod? of the truth of, of what he had, of, of the sin that he had committed. And um, that did not, did not work out. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So tonight we're talking about um, Jesus' baptism in particular, all right? But much of that story centers around John the Baptist because he was kind of the other, uh, the, the supporting main character, if you want to want to call him that, right? So, um, the background, we don't know much at all about just about 30 years of Jesus' life, okay? We know that when he was about two or three, um, he, he went to Egypt. And we know he was there, I believe, for about three years, and then he came back. And then we know that, um, that at about the age of... of between 8 and 12, he got forgotten, right? Got forgotten in, in Jerusalem, and, and he's, uh, they, they came back and found him in the temple. Okay? Other than that, we don't know much about his upbringing. There's, there, there isn't anything chronicled, uh, really, except for those few, those few instances in his birth. So, um, the only other thing that we know is that the child grew and became strong, was filled with wisdom and with the grace of God, uh, and the grace of God was upon him. And another scripture says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Okay? So, since we're kind of talking about John the Baptist in, in, the, uh, in this story, um, a thought came to mind. So, who in here grew up around their cousins? You don't have any cousins. Okay. All right. So, um, were, any, anybody close to their cousins? Okay. Went to ball games, went to the lake, to the river, whatever the case is. Okay. I, I did the same thing, uh, the same thing with many of my cousins. Uh, even the ones that lived six hours away, uh, we were still close. And... Um, so I think, I think about Jesus and John the Baptist in this, that their first interaction is in utero, right? They're in the womb. And even at that time, 
John the Baptist knew fully who Jesus was. And so I just think about the conversations that the two of them prob probably had uh, in, in their times as, as, uh, as John the Baptist was learning how to make uh, camel skin clothes and all that good stuff, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so John the Baptist had been preaching in the wilderness and people were flocking to see him. He baptized those who believed his, who believed his message. And this was his, his message. People should turn away from their sin. That was the main, the main gist of his message. And once, once they accepted that message, he would, he would baptize them into that truth. Okay? Um, when Jesus came to John, John naturally wondered why. As you listen to the story, notice how Jesus answered his question and how God demonstrated that Jesus was his son. All right? So here's the story. Just as Isaiah had prophesied, John the Baptist preached in the, in the wilderness in order to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now this was foretold in uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And it's kind of interesting... Uh, Isaiah chapter 40 is where several of the movements of, Masson, of, of Handel's Messiah came from. Um, oh, they went out of my mind. Anyway, um, it, it, it's interesting to, to realize that that passage had, had, is, is full of richness in, in a lot of church history, right? Um, he told the people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. John lived on, on locusts and wild honey in the desert and wore clothes of camel hair. And people came from everywhere to see him. If anyone confessed uh, his sins, John baptized in the, them in the Jordan River. Some people thought John might be the Messiah, the Christ, but John assured them that he wasn't. He told them of another that was coming, the true Messiah. John said, I baptize you with water for repentance, John, he explained, but the Messiah would baptize people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He described how the Messiah would come to gather his, to gather his wheat, but burn up all the chaff. John said he wasn't even worthy to carry the Savior's sandals. So one day Jesus came down from Galilee to be baptized by John. And John didn't understand this. He felt that he should be baptized by Jesus, not the other way around. So how many times do we read where Jesus doesn't quite go along, along with uh, the st status quo? <laughs> quite, quite a lot, right? Um, think about the uh, washing of the feet, right? Um, he, was, he was the honored guest. He should not have been washing the feet, but yet he was the servant that did it. Um, going along the Samaritan road, right? That's not the way we do. We take the long way around because the Samaritans don't like us. Um, uh, not being afraid to associate with, with those who you weren't to associate with, right? Um, Talking to lepers, being being around lepers, all of these things. They, it was counter to what the culture was. But Jesus told him that this was right, uh, that this was the right thing to do in order to fulfill all righteousness. So John agreed to it. All right. So Jesus, Jesus said that baptism was done in order to fulfill all righteousness. Okay. So before we talk too much about the baptism, how many things that Jesus did are we really able to do ourselves? How many in here have walked on water? How many in here have has multiplied uh, five loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000 people? How many people have laid hands on somebody and they've, and they've been, been healed of blindness, of um, uh, the issue of blood? Uh, how many in here can forgive uh, a person's sins? <laughs> okay. 
though, when you think about it, there's not a whole lot of things that Jesus actually did that we do on a regular basis, right? Now, he's given us power to do all things that, that he has done. And it's, you know, us trying to figure out how, how to allow that, to, to, that work to be done through us. But in the natural, there's nothing that we can do uh, with regard to what Jesus, has, what Jesus did on earth. Except for this act. Okay? And Jesus said that baptism was done in order to fulfill all righteousness. Okay? So, if we can do anything that Jesus has done, don't you think we should do it? I mean, what, what is it that, a, that Amy has, uh, keeps, keeps saying over and over and over through all of her messages? We're more, we're more like Christ. What was that? Yeah, stuff everyone writes down. We are more like Christ when we act, act like him, do, do what he did, right? And so I basically bring this up because here in a few weeks we have water baptism coming up, right? And so I just... Uh, if you, as you read through the New Testament, you'll realize that baptism was not just, just a, a lightly taken uh, thing or even really much, much of a, a decision on the, on the parts of new Christians. They would be saved. They would be baptized. Over and over and over again, it would, it would be, they receive salvation, they are baptized. They receive salvation, they are baptized. If we think of Philip with the, with the Ethiopian, right? He's running along this guy. He explains, consequently, the book of Isaiah to him. And then he receives Christ. And he says, well, shouldn't I be, shouldn't I be baptized? Well, yes, you should. So we, they went and did it, right? Um, and so I say this only because if you have not yet been baptized in water after being saved, it's an important step to make because it's a proclamation. And in Jesus' own words, this is done in order to, fulfill, order to fulfill all righteousness. Okay? Baptism has nothing to do with salvation, but it's a proclamation by us for the decisions that we've made. Okay. Um, we'll talk about that again because it's important enough. As soon as Jesus was baptized and came out of the water, heaven opened and God's spirit came down like a dove, landing on him. Then a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And this was a sign to John that Jesus was definitely the Christ, because God had told him, The man whom you see the spirit come down and remain in, he is... Uh, uh, is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit? And John, uh, then John called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay, um, who in here maybe has been was raised either in Catholicism or in uh, as a a Lutheran? Okay, so anybody in here know the Agnus Day? Okay, that's uh, it, in 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 the Catholic Mass. The Agnus Day was was one of the of the five parts of of, of the Mass, and um, uh, it was the second part I, part I believe. I haven't gone through it in my head for a while, but the words are Agnus Day, qui tollis peccata mundi, um, pe, uh, dona nobis pacem. And then it's repeated once, and then again, it's Agnus Dei, Quitolis Peccata Mundi, uh, Miserere Nobis. And that translates into, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Le Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Okay? And so this prayer is in almost every uh, every Christian denominational faith. It is, it's, it, there are, uh, Mozart wrote movements 
on, on, these, on these three uh, statements. And it all comes back from the one statement that John the Baptist made of him. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So there really isn't much, much more to say about Jesus, is there? He is the Lamb of God who takes away and took my sins away and many of yours from the world, right? So, um, so Jesus doing the opposite of what of what is expected of, of the times, right? Um, most of the time, Jesus spent his time serving others, and other times he spent reversing that role because it was expected opposite. He, you know, he was the one who should have been in charge in John the Baptist's mind, right? But he subjugated himself to, to John the Baptist. And so by doing that, he once again shows us how to humble ourselves, right? Taking, taking the lower road and allow, allowing others to, to um, uh, be built up by, by his acts, okay? Anybody have any comments? What's that? You said them while I was talking. <laughs> mm -hmm. How often is it that our obedience is directly related to how humble we are? <laughs> isn't, isn't that something? That those, those two things, uh, somebody who is obedient and haughty at the same time is only obedient in act, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, when we humble ourselves and do what is expected of us, that's what. That's when we are truly uh, being obedient. Yeah. Yep. And that's that's as as. As we as Christians do baptism, that, that is what it, what it signifies, is dying to the flesh and coming again and, and living in the Spirit. And that's, um, there's, there's so much symbolism in it that, um, you know, we could, we could talk half the night just, just about the symbolism of it. Come on, and yeah. So, for those of you, if, uh, if you have not, whether you're you're watching online or if you're in here, if you have not been baptized, I strongly encourage you. We have ha have an opportunity coming up here next month, um, right here in our own our own uh, sanctuary. Take advantage of that if if you have not yet. So. Um.
In light of his odd clothes and lifestyle, yeah, they're talking about John the Baptist again, um, did his message affect people's hearts? Yep. They were baptized. They came to believe that they needed to turn away from their sins, right? Yep. Exactly. And um, I think it was Nathaniel, if I remember right, uh, one of the disciples. He was actually one of John's disciples before, he, before John sent him to, to, to follow Jesus. And, uh, or before Jesus called him to follow him. So I'm not sure how, how it happened off the uh, top of my head. But, um, so to know that, that their, their ministry was, was, uh, was one and the same, to show people the path to, the, to Christ, right? Um, So what happened immediately after Jesus was baptized? Jesus comes up out of the water. The Holy Spirit comes down. Exactly. It is, it is, a, it is the one instance of all, all three persons of God being in the same instant. Okay? Okay. And I know it's 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 hard to wrap our brain around around this three and three and one deal, right? But here here in and of it of itself is is evidence that it really is three persons acting as one. Okay? And so you have the voice of God the Father that everyone hears. Right? It wasn't. It wasn't just Jesus that heard him. It wasn't just John. It was everyone. Everyone who was there heard. It was the Spirit that descended in a visible form that everybody could see. And then there was Jesus embodied before them. And so that's that's uh, you know a one in in history uh, to this point, other other than. Uh, probably in Eden when when God was making making the world right because they they each had a had a part in that the holy spirit was uncreated living uncreated just just as as the bible says that Jesus existed uncreated before before the foundations of the earth the holy spirit was the same way and um it, when you read in genesis you actually uh, you, you'll actually read that the holy spirit hovered over uh, the waters of the earth. So, and that was that was before the uh, the continuation of creation. So. Hmm? I'm sure some were. One, one would think, and it, it could very well be that some of the Sadducees could very well have, have, left, have left the order because they realized, uh, for, for those who, who don't know, the Sadducees believed that really the Messiah was never coming or that he had already come and it was too late. But they, uh, you know, it... it Kind of the, the tongue-in-cheek way of saying it is that the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't have any hope. They didn't have any hope in the Messiah. And so that, that's kind of how you, how you can remember the difference between the Pharisees, who were all about following the law, and the Sadducees, who followed the law, but they didn't see any purpose in it. Because the Messiah was never coming. He was never going to come. Um, Yeah. 
Sadducees were sad, you see. It is. It is. It, to, to me, it's, it's the equivalent of, of uh, living in an agnostic or an atheistic life. Um, so why do you think God gave visible and audible signs of his presence at Jesus' baptism? To prove that, that Jesus was God's son. Right? This is my son who I am well pleased. <laughs> and what is the significance of the... Oh, we already talked about that one. Um, what did John say the Lamb of God would do? He would take away the sins of the world and baptize with the Spirit. Exactly. That's, that's what I was going to say. He, it could have been every time that he walked up. <laughs> yeah. Really? can't other than they didn't get wet <laughs> no yeah mm -hmm. yeah yep yep the past the past on on dry on dry soil which, you know, there's, there's this, uh, I think Corey brought it up when, when he taught about the parting of the Red Sea, that there's this phenomenon where there is a, a giant gust of wind that actually drives back the Red Sea and, uh, to where people can, can, you know, potentially get, a, get across it without, uh, without being in the water. Um, but the reality is that, you know, imagine how long the bottom of, of uh, like Lake Mead, let's think about that for a bit. You know, it's hundreds of feet under what it normally is, right? 190, 220, something like that feet, lower than it normally is. But the reality is, is that the soil that's been uh, uncovered a month ago is still mucky, <laughs> right? You walk in it and you're sinking to your knees because it's still mucky. But so if it had been that phenomenon, you know, it would have had to blown for two months in order to dry out the, the soil enough to walk across. And so um, it's uh, just one, mo one more, you know, way that God just shows off. You know, look what I can do. Woo. <laughs> mm -hmm. The spoils of Egypt. Spices and, yep. Oh yeah, or how long the how many miles long the wagon train was? We start having you know, basically two million men. Uh, that's a that's a long caravan. <laughs> All right, so 
in a baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire, is that something that, that you have experienced? Okay. Yeah. Maybe not the fire part so much, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if, if we, yeah, if it's not fire of flame, it's fire of spirit. And it is, it is, uh, flame has, has always had a, uh, a, a symbolistic view of light and of, and of power. Um, that, you know, when, when you go ahead, it has the, uh, when you have a torch and you have it ahead of you and you walk forward, the, the, the flame has the power to part darkness, right? And so if, if you think about that, along with the, the uh, at the baptism of the Holy, Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, it said that, that it was like flames of fire land, landing on, on people while they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so that is, that is the, the true fulfillment of the prophecy. Yep. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you mean? <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Yeah, they, they weren't, yeah, they weren't burned because, because they, they told, I always have to think of which, which ruler it was at the time, Darius? Or was it Nebuchadnezzar? Told King Nebi? Told Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, we need to watch the Veggie Tales so we can get the Bible right, right? So, <laughs> so um, they told Nebuchadnezzar that uh, that you can throw us in the fire all you want, and even if we're burned and we die, we will not turn away from God. And so that made him mad, and he lit it up hotter, so hot that the people that threw him in even died, and then. Uh, while they were they were in there, he noticed that they weren't being burned, and that there was a fourth man in there. And so at that point, they were in in the fire, communing with Jesus, and Jesus was 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 delivering them from that to prove his power over Nebuchadnezzar's. So that's that's what happened. So much so that they came out and didn't even smell of smoke, is what the word says. Um, now I, I will say, you know, the, the sound of the rushing wind that they, that they talk about, um, back in the, in the, would have been the late forties, early fifties, um, when my dad was young and my uncle was, was young, my grandfather was late coming to the Lord. And the reason he, he wouldn't, uh, come to the Lord was because he felt that he, he had some personal hang-ups that if he if he came to church and continued doing them he would be a hypocrite he wasn't going to be a hypocrite and uh what happened with him was he was uh he was working at a, uh, a munitions plant during world, world war ii and uh god completely delivered him of of that hang-up and after that he never ha never had a desire to do it again and so he became a christian after that and then he, he sought after the baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, just had a hard, hard time receiving it. And one time, uh, one day he was praying in, in their home and my uncle was outside praying and my aunt was outside praying. And they said all of a sudden they could just hear the house rattle and shake. And at that point, my grandfather was filled with the Holy Spirit. Hmm? It doesn't matter. It was his, his own. It was his own thing that he thought if, if people saw him doing, it would it would uh, make them think, oh, here's this guy that does X, Y, or Z. Now he's going to church thinking he's all that, and he just he just wasn't gonna wasn't gonna have it. 
Mexico. Yep, they do. Exactly. And at the time, I mean, even when I when I grew up, um, you know, the the judgmentalness of of the church was was way too high, and that's one thing Amy and I both have have realized that you know we we need to realize that there is a balance between uh, the working out of our salvation right that's that's what the what the, the bible says work out your salvation in fear and trembling and so if if we if we begin to judge people because they're not where we think they should be um then we're we're missing the point that we're not the judge we're not the jury we're not the jury, we're not the prosecutor, right? The prosecutor's job is taken up by Satan, right? The defender's job is taken up by Jesus, and uh, the jury is God. The judge and jury is God the Father, okay? Eating with tax collectors. I, I grew up believing and knowing about the Lamb's Book of Life, right? Everybody know the Lamb's Book of Life? The scripture says that, that our names will be written in the, the Lamb's. I always pictured God writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life with a pencil and a big long eraser at the end. And then he'd be writing my name and then I'd do something and he'd erase it back out. And then I'd have to get saved all and he'd write my name back in. <laughs> right? Now... I believe that my name can be blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life, but I don't think it's nearly as easy as some think it is or as hard as others think it is, right? Some people think there's, there's, there's no way it can happen, and there's some people that think every time, every time you, you, you step in something yucky, uh, you know, you, you step in, in, a, uh, in a dog's mess, well, there you're, you're unclean, wipe them out of the Lamb's book, right? And so I've, I came to the realization quite some time ago that I am going to leave the judging of people in God's hands. My job is to look at people's fruit, identify when they have struggles, and to help them ad address those struggles. And that is what Jesus did when he was here. Right? Met with the woman at the well. He didn't condemn her at all. He sat there, he told her everything she had done wrong. Yeah, the man you're living with now isn't your, isn't your husband and you have eight others. Right? Um, the, the woman who was brought to be stoned didn't judge her at all. Sin and go, uh, go and sin no more. And so, if we can remember that, and we can be vocal about that in our, in our daily lives, that's when we can help to bring people to the Lord.